asking which aspect of a child's development is more important, nature or nurture, is like asking which is more important, the length or the width of a rectangle. Of course, both are equally important. In this video, we will talk about the mechanisms of nature that produce a unique human child. We will also learn how developmentalists track the process of nurturing a child's growth. Each of the trillions of cells in your body has one thing in common, your unique genetic blueprint. Imagine looking through a powerful microscope into a single cell and going right to the nucleus at its center. Inside the nucleus, you see 23 pairs of chromosomes. Its DNA, uh, your hereditary material, wrapped around a protein and in, a do in a double uh, spiral or uh, helix pattern. A sequence of DNA encodes a genes. Uh, meaning it contains a direction that a gene will express or follow. Now, a gene can make a cell become a part of an arm or a lung. It can also regulate other genes or simply be uh, what's, uh, what is called junk DNA. In people, a uh, gene varies in size from a few hundred DNA segments, uh, which we call as base pair molecules, to more than two million segments. Now, the Human Genome Project has estimated that humans have a total of between 20,000 and 25,000 genes. Each of your parents uh, gave you uh, half of your original 46 chromosomes. It happened when your father's sperm joined with your mother's ovum and become a single fertilized egg called a zygote. In that moment, DNA came uh, from each parent to form your unique genetic blueprint. It, uh, in the transfer of a mother and father's genes to the new zygote, the chromosome from the mother has one version of a gene and the chromosome from the father has another version of the same gene. These versions are called the alleles or a particular uh, or rather of a particular gene. So small differences in the sequence of DNA based pair molecules in the alleles from both parents contribute to the child's unique physical and psychological features. Now, most, most genes are the same in all people, but a small number of genes that is less than 1% of the total uh, are slightly different between individuals. This is why your DNA is unlike anyone else's in the, uh, on the planet. Now, the exceptions, of course, are identical twins because they are the result of uh, splitting the same fertilized zygote into two zygotes. And even their genes differ over time through a process called gene mutation. As mentioned previously, a gene is the basic biological unit of heredity. The, the DNA in your genes contain instructions dictating a particular structure, function, or trait to be expressed. Now, the term gene expression describes what happens to the surrounding cell when DNA is activated at any point before or after birth. It's, it, uh, it is what gives each cell a purpose. So, uh, how are genes expressed in the body? I'm glad that you asked because genes promote uh, cell growth by dictating the production of amino acids, uh, enzymes, and other uh, proteins essential to the formation of other cells. Genes also regulate cell differentiation during mitosis. A particular uh, cell might become a part of your hand or your stomach. Finally, genes regulate the pace and timing of, the hum of human growth and development by turning on and off other genes. When it's time for a growth spurt during early childhood, uh, or rather certain genes will signal the cells, to, uh, the cells of bones, muscles, and other organs. Genes also uh, 
uh, are regulated by surrounding proteins. Genetic scientists have now uh, counted and named each of the 46 chromosomes and many of the estimated 25,000 human genes, calling them uh, by numbers and letters or a combination of the two. They've also attempted to count the number of DNA based on each chromosome with uh, the objective of associating genes, DNA bases, and chromosomal locations with specific human traits. Now, there are four patterns of genetic expressions in human uh, reproduction. Simple dominant recessive inheritance, sex-linked inheritance, and uh, co-dominant uh, inheritance, and uh, polygenetic or multiple gene inheritance. So thousands of human traits are determined by a single pair of genes or alleles. In each pair, one gene and uh, the trait associated with it tends to dominate. This is then the dominant gene. The other is recessive. When these two uh, different genes occur in a single fertilized egg, only one dominates. Uh, as you see uh, in this uh, example. So... Uh, Dominant traits include dark hair, curly hair, normal vision, and even Huntington disease. Uh, however, recessive traits include blonde hair, straight hair, nearsightedness, and uh, normal brain. So let's look at uh, the trait of nearsightedness. About three quarters of all people have normal vision. While the remaining quarter are nearsighted, that, uh, me including, uh, so the gene that bestows uh, normal vision is dominant and the nearsighted uh, gene is a weaker recessive allele. This means that someone can be born nearsighted only when they inherit uh, two recessive nearsighted alleles. People of this genotype will then pass a nearsighted gene to their children who will display a nearsighted uh, phenotype. But can two normal sighted uh, people produce a nearsighted child? Well, yes. If the mother and father both carry one normal vision allele and one nearsighted allele, they both can pass on the recessive allele and produce a nearsighted child. Huntington's, uh, Huntington's disease, which caused a gradual uh, degeneration of the nervous system, is uh, a genetically inherited disease like uh, linked to a dominant rather than recessive gene. If a, pa if a parent carries the gene for Huntington's disease, his offspring have a 50% chance of inheriting it. If that gene is inherited, the individual will get the disease which usually strikes after the age of 40. Fortunately, it is a rare uh, disease. So, some single gene uh, inherited characteristics are determined by gene location or genes located on the sex chromosomes. Males have XY sex chromosomes and females have XX sex chromosomes. Now, the vast majority of sex linked uh, contributes or rather attributes are produced by recessive genes that are found only on X chromosomes, most often affecting males. Why is that? Uh, with the XY cro sex chromosomes, males are more susceptible to sex-linked traits because they don't have an additional X chromosome to carry an alternative, an, an alternative version of the gene. Of the more than 100 sex-linked characteristics, many are disabling. This includes hemophilia, two kinds of muscular dystrophy, and certain forms of deafness. So, most human traits are influenced uh, by many pairs of gene alleles, not just one set. Polygenetic traits include height and weight, intelligence, skin color, susceptibility to cancer, and even temperament. Most personality traits are also this type, with the result that a child is never exactly like his mother or father. More often, each of us inherit uh, some or uh, some of both of our parents' personalities. So all this talk about chromosomes, DNA, and genes drive the question of whether heredity is destiny. 
So the short answer or the answer in one word is no with a caveat unless an individual is the recipient of a gene for a fatal congenital disease, a disease or condition for which there is no known cure. Two such diseases are Huntington's disease and cystic fibrosis. In the vast majority of people or uh, of people heredity is not destiny. Genes are involved in creating susceptibilities to a disease and environmental influences can either moderate or trigger such a genetic vulnerability. For most of us, heredity is only part of the larger picture. Given the fact that so many inherited illnesses are believed to be polygenic in origin, it has been difficult for researchers to isolate the primary genes that give someone a higher risk to uh, a particular disease. Since the mo uh, monumental decoding of the, gene, uh, of the human genome in 2003, molecular uh, geneticists have been working feverishly around the world to make uh, these uh, definitive links. The goal of this research is to find new avenues of uh, treatment for disease by or for four diseases by intervening at the at the site of the genes exp of the genes expression. Progress has occurred, but no major breakthrough in terms of genetic information leading to a cure has uh, have been uh, made. So some children are affected by heredity early in life in ways that disrupt their normal development. Sometimes eggs or sperms uh, or, or sperm have more the, have more or fewer than the usual 23 pairs of chromosome. The best example is Down syndrome. Babies with this condition have distinctive facial features including a fold over uh, the eyelid and a smaller head. Now, they appear to develop normally during the first uh, few months, but their mental and behavioral growths soon lag behind uh, their peers. Intellect, intellectual disability or uh, uh, what we previously call as mental retardation is the usual outcome. Babies with Down syndrome typically have an extra 21st chromosome that is usually provided by an egg with uh, the abnormality. An older mother's egg, which have uh, been in her ovaries since her adolescence, may have uh, deteriorated over time, causing a higher incidence of Down syndrome for mothers giving birth after the age of 40. So this is where nature meets nurture. Behavioral genetics is a relatively new scientific field that aims to trace the herd hereditability of different traits and illnesses. To do that, researchers study the relative uh, weight of inherited and environmental influences on a person. But behavioral geneticists' interests go beyond inherited illnesses or disabilities. They also want to quantify the nature-nurture balance in normal human intelligence, personality, and mental health. Researchers come to behavioral genetics from many other fields including genetics, zoology, biology, psychiatry, and even psychology. Through behavioral genetics, scientists are able to uh, compute for hereditability, which is a mathematical estimate of the degree of genetic influence on a specific trait, illness, uh, of, on a specific trait illness or behavior. So hereditability estimates for a given trait can range from 0 0.00 to 1.00. The higher value means there is a strong, uh, stronger genetic influence on a particular trait. Height is estimated at 0.90, meaning your height is highly dictated by how tall your parents are and the height of their genetic lineage. Um, any, her any heritability value higher than 0.50 is considered significant. Here are some examples of more complex human behaviors and their heritability estimates. General intelligence has 0.52 uh, heritability estimate. Verbal fluency has 0.30. 
sociability has 0.64, extroversion has uh, 0.51, anxiety has 0.70, aggression has 0.40, Belief in God has 0.22, hyperactivity has 0.75, obesity computed by body mass index has 0 .9, uh, 0 0.50 to 0.90, alcoholism uh, has between 0.50 to 0.70, and schizophrenia has 0.70. So, researchers have found that someone's cognitive ability, that is learning aptitude, has a lot to do with heredity. Personality too has a big inherited component, particularly temperament or your dominant mood and style of behavior from birth. Several studies have shown that contrary to researchers' original expectations, hereditability uh, values for cognitive or intellectual skills actually increase with age. That means that as you get older, the relative influence of your parents' intellectual uh, strengths and weaknesses is greater than when you were a child. Wrap around, wrap your head around that one, right? So, in contrast to our cognitive abilities, when it comes to personality traits where heredity plays a significant role, extroversion, emotionality, and activity level, heritability appears to diminish as a child matures into, uh, into adulthood. Perhaps this is simply the teenager settling into his own identity and responding to new environmental influences. That is college, profession, close uh, relationships that continue to shape him or her. So how do behavioral geneticists come up with uh, these heritability values? There are actually two methods used, twin studies and adoption studies. In twin studies, Researchers compare the genetic contribution to a given trait by comparing measurements from identical and non-identical twins. Remember, identical twins shared a fertilized egg, so they are genetically identical too. Non-identical twins each had their own fertilized egg, uh, thus, uh, uh, thus sperm and eggs, and are no more genetically alike than any two siblings that is 50% on average. But both types of twins are usually raised in the same or similar environments. So the major difference between each twin is the amount of genetic material they have in common, plus any non-shared aspects of their environments. Here's how they do it, using IQ as an example. First, they take a measurement of each twin's IQ, and then they correlate the measurement between the members of each pair of twins. So remember that a correlation measures the strength of, a, of an association between two variables with a higher number uh, correlation demonstrating a stronger association. Then uh, they compare the correlations for identical twins to the correlations for non-identical twins. If there is an important genetic contribution to IQ, the identical twin correlation would be much higher than the correlation for the non-identical uh, non twin. Now, a, her a heritability estimate is then arrived at by doubling the difference between the two correlations. Now, the other method for computing heritability uh, uses adoption studies. Adopted children share 50% of their genetic material with their biological parents and siblings and 0% of their genetic material with their adopted families, with whom they share 100% of, of their environment. Adopted uh, adoption studies compare correlations between both biological and adopted uh, children. If there is an important genetic influence on a particular trait, the correlation with the biological family member should be considerably higher than the correlation with the adopted family member. While behavioral genetics offer answers to the mystery of heritability, a lot of questions remain. Some typical questions about the degree to which genes shape the individual over time include these head scratchers. 
wouldn't a child with a predisposition to solitary and quiet activities tend to choose solitary activities which would then reinforce this personality type as he grows up? So another is that because extroversion and introversion have a significant heritability factor, if a child has an introverted parent or parents or sibling or siblings, wouldn't this tend to shape the family environment and reinforce this behavior? Another, uh, so each question raises an important point about the interaction between genes and environment. Remember that life is a constant interplay between the two. There are two more uh, advanced uh, concepts to help track how nature and nurture work together to create a pers uh, the person that you are. Uh, these are reaction range and niche peaking. So reaction range refers to the fact that the same genotype can manifest as a variety of phenotypes depending on the different environmental factors to which you are exposed to. Let's apply this principle to IQ. As you just learned, IQ has a significant heritability value of 0.52. This leaves plenty of room, well theoretically a value of 0.48 for other environmental factors to impact a child's eventual manifested intelligence school and tutors, educated parents who spent a great deal of time discussing scholastic matter with their kids, and other things. Now, reaction range is, uh, or rather in this context, defines the number of possible manifestations given the inherited trait. For example, the higher a child's inherited IQ, the wider her possibility or her possible range of IQ manifestation. Essentially, this child has more to work with. A child who inherit or in, or a child who inherits a lower IQ has a narrower range of possible outcomes, but his IQ can still uh, be favor favorably influenced. Another uh, is uh, niche peaking. Uh, so uh, niche peaking is a useful concept uh, because it is seen uh, to be taking place when a young person deliberately seeks out an environment to fit his heredity. In an ongoing feedback loop, he receives positive signals when he is in an, uh, he, he is, he is in an appropriate environment for his temperament, IQ, or any other inherited uh, trait. When a given choice, even an extroverted uh, four-year-old can uh, can at least express a preference between a preschool that puts more emphasis on early reading versus one that provides more outside play. He picks the niche that feels right for him. When it comes to the growth of the brain, beginning in the womb and then uh, every day after the neurons uh, conducting in contrast with structural brain cells are where most of the action takes place. Every newborn baby has billions of neurons, each shaped like a tree here. <laughs> now, the neuron's body or trunk is called the axon. Each cell contains a nucleus that controls the neuron's basic metaboli uh, metabolic functions. The axon can be seen as sending out information to other neurons. Every mature neuron also has a root system called uh, dendrites. Uh, these dendrites receive chemical messages in the form of a neurotransmitter from other neurons, which travel across a gap called synapse. Special receptors on the dendrites bind to the arriving neurotransmitter triggering an electrical response into the receiving neurons. Now, new, uh, new neurons are generated at an astounding rate throughout pregnancy. For neurons to grow and thus the brain to enlarge, synapse, uh, synapse formation is of crucial importance. With 1.8 million new synapses per second produced from uh, the time a fetus is two months of age until the child reaches uh, the age of two. 
Because the synapse is the place where two neurons communicate with each other to allow this uh, phenomenal growth to take place, the dendrites of each neuron must develop larger surfaces. This process has been compared to the unfettered growth of a forest. One of the jobs of genes is to direct the growth of neurons, uh, axons, and dendrites to their correct location in the brain. And that doesn't only mean getting each neuron to its own right location. Every neuron must also be connected to the other neuron with which they must maintain communication. For example, a neuron in the retina of the eye needs to have a direct communication line to the visual area of the thalamus. So how does that occur? Uh, how does that occur? Neuroscientists aren't really sure. But one important piece of uh, uh, the process they have identified is the producing and pruning of synapses that goes on during gestation and early childhood. In fact, children are thought to produce twice as many synapses as they will eventually need. But this overgrowth of neural synapses is just nature doing its job. After uh, overgrowth, neuroscientists say nurture steps in to help the brain sort out and keep the neurons, uh, synapses, and neural connections that are most useful to the developing child. Only the neurons and connections that uh, the child's brain uses are kept. Now, the rest are thinned or pruned away uh, from lack of use. So, the peak period of synaptic growth in children occurs between the age of 1 and 6. By age 14, dramatic pruning of those, synapse, of those synapses has taken place. This fact of neurobiology has enormous implication for parents and, other, uh, and, and, and others who interact with young children, including you future teachers. A young brain is shaped by the child's earliest experiences. Everything a child sees, touches, hears, tastes, and smells uh, is translated into specific electrical brain circuit, which then tends to dominate the child's brain. If a child's experiences uh, many fearful ex uh, if a child experiences many fearful experiences early in life, Fear and mistrust gets hardwired in her emotional brain circuit. If she gets lots of love and cuddling, her brain reflects that instead. Now, the key factors that make the difference between which response and behaviors are kept and which fall away and uh, are repetition and uh, reinforcement. Your individual pattern of neural connections form the basis of all your movements, thoughts, memories, and feelings. In a word, it forms you. So, uh, the neuroscience of child development does not say that the case is closed for a child's emotional and cognitive brain growth by age 3, 6, or late adolescence. In fact, research increasingly provides more and more evidence that the brain never stops growing and changing throughout adolescence and well into adulthood and old age. The term plastic is used to describe the brain's lifelong ability to reorganize itself in response to input received from the environment. It involves both increases in the number of connections between neurons and physical changes in the shape and structure of those connections. It accounts for learning, memory, and recovery from traumatic head injuries throughout one's lifespan. Now, the caveat to this neural plasticity or neuroplasticity is that as you age, the rewiring of your uh, the rewiring of your neural connections gets harder and takes longer. 
interventions with children and teens in response to emotional and psychological problems or learning disabilities are now routinely and effectively done as early as possible. These interventions may include psychotherapy for disorders such as depression or OCD. There are also methods for the uh, retraining of vision and other senses uh, and other sense perceptions for uh, learning problems such as dyslexia. The advantage of doing any of these interventions earlier rather than later in a child's life is to intervene and help the brain rewire before its connections are set in their ways. There uh, is a fixed sequence to uh, the development of a child's brain. This makes knowing which ability and functions mature first and last beginning at uh, birth fundamental to, uh, to child and, and developmental psychology. Here's a, a rough guide to the sequence process uh, of, of brain uh, wiring, uh, starting from the earliest brain areas to uh, mature and ending with those that take place the longest. First, basic autonomic functions in the brain stems, including breathing, heartbeat, and uh, temper uh, temperature control. Second, emotional learning in the brain's central limbic system controls the processing of incoming sensory information and memory storage, and tags it for further processing in the frontal cortex. Third, vision and hearing in the rear occipital lobe and uh, the temporal lobes above your ears. And fourth, uh, or rather fourth, speech and language production in the temporal lobes. And finally, planning and abstract reasoning as well as emotional and motor control in the frontal lobes behind your forehead. So, the brain's neural wiring process is cumulative. This means that the, uh, in order for the thinking part of the frontal cortex to function properly, its limbic feeling centers has to develop first. So in this video, we uh, talked about uh, the mechanisms of nature that produce a unique human child. We also learned how developmentalists track the process of nurturing a child's growth. Here are our uh, key takeaways from today's lesson. First, Although the uh, heritability of some traits such as height are high, many more human characteristics such as intelligence are only moderately heritable. Twin studies uh, provide a valuable way of assessing uh, or a valuable way to assess the relative weight of nature or nurture uh, in that a larger number of traits are the same or similar in twin siblings. Uh, brain is uh, the, the brain is plastic well to a point and cells are constantly regrowing to uh, or being pruned for lack of use lastly sensitive periods of, of brain growth favor, favors learning certain skills uh, uh, at these times so once again uh, this has been Dex Kamitan and thank you for watching